Good morning, everyone, and a happy new year. Welcome to 2022. It's my privilege to be able to share God's word with you this morning. Today, I'm reading from Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so you may discern what his will is, what is good, acceptable and perfect. Each year I try to set a text, something for us to focus on as a church family, to pray through um, and something to encourage us. And I try to spend some time in prayer beforehand, asking God what his will is for us as a fellowship and what will be helpful for us in the coming year as we seek to walk in the path that he has for us. This year I've chosen Romans 12 verses 1 to 2. And I want us to focus predominantly on this thought that worship is not predominantly or even mostly about coming to a church service as integral as that is and singing songs. But worship is really about our rhythms, priorities, actions and decisions we make from Monday to Saturday. Worship is about our embodied life each and every day. And as we look at this passage this morning, um, this is the thought that I want us to be thinking about and focusing on as we move into 2022. I remember vividly abseiling when I was a child. I remember that feeling of presenting my body to the abyss below. I was 10, and I was probably only up as high as a house, but it certainly felt like an abyss to me. I remember hanging over the side, holding onto the rope, forcing my feet to step back off the ledge, even though a big part of me didn't want to. And I also remember the outdoor instructor, a guy I thought was really cool, looking at me in the eye and saying, don't worry, I've got you. His gaze never left me until my feet were safely on the ground. His skill and attention didn't wane until my feet were planted firmly on the hillside below. Skip forward 20 years and I'm doing the same thing with my daughter on Go Ape in Thetford Forest. Don't worry, Lucia. I've got you. I can do it. You can do it. I'm with you. It was her first time on the high ropes and I was with her, just behind her on the course. In a very real way, she was presenting her body to the abyss, <laughs> launching herself across ropes and into trees. At the start of our passage today, Paul is saying the same thing. He's saying, I am with you. The Greek word we translate as appeal is a word of leadership to the church saying, come with me and tread where I tread. Do what I do. I'm beside you. I'm not just giving you an instruction from behind, but I'm right here with you, alongside, accompanying. So as we present our bodies, our hearts and our minds to God again this new year, we do it together. We do it as a family. Even though sometimes it feels that we're hanging over an abyss. <laughs> we are truly beside one another. And Christ is beside us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And he beckons us on together. But Paul adds something else as well, doesn't he? We're not really hanging over an unforgiving, unfathomable abyss when we surrender everything to God. 
We don't present ourselves before a God who is unpredictable, selfish or absent-minded. Paul is clear that we do this, we present our bodies, our minds and our hearts before God in view of God's mercies. And God knows and loves us better than we know ourselves. We must always keep God's mercies in mind as the context and reason that we worship him. We give ourselves to him precisely because he is full of mercy and steadfast, steadfast love. Our God is faithful. So what are, God, what are God's mercies to us that we are to keep in mind? Here are just a few, I think, relate to our passage. God has saved us body, mind and soul. When we speak about salvation, being saved in Jesus, it means total salvation. Body, mind and soul, body, mind and heart. We are holistic people and God has saved us holistically. He's not just saved one part of us. There are long enduring myths within the church, false myths, <laughs> um, that Christianity is about escaping the prison of our bodies and this earthly coil and floating into somewhere ethereal called heaven one day when we die. However, the Bible speaks of God bringing heaven, which is God's perfect and eternal rule, to earth. God became a physical person in Jesus Christ and remains so. His resurrected body ascended to heaven with the promise of returning as such. And we can read about that in Luke 24 verse 50. So therefore God has redeemed our soul, our mind and our bodies and all of creation, which is God's beautiful planet he's given us to live in and care for. What an incredible mercy that is to hold on to and to keep in mind. Secondly, he's forgiven us our sin that warps our reality. On the cross, Jesus defeated our toxic rebellion against God once and for all. The inherent pattern of mistrust in God, selfishness, pride and ill ambition has been broken. Our sin warps how we as humanity and as individuals treat God, treat others and the world around us. It eats away and destroys our relationships. And relationship is what all of God's creation is built on and infused with. Jesus can bring us to a point where we see this reality in new, with new eyes and then understand our part in it all. Often we're blind to this beforehand. And as we seek forgiveness and turn away from our rebellion, God forgives us, cleanses us, and we start to become a new creation in him. This is all because of Jesus. He has enabled this to happen because he paid the price for our sin. Of course, this is a process of discipleship, isn't it? a lifetime of following and becoming. We're not perfect and we all make mistakes, but the power of sin that ruled our lives and condemned us to death is now broken if we're found in Jesus. And the overarching power at work in our lives is the power of the Holy Spirit. What another incredible mercy to have in view as we present ourselves to God on this new year. And thirdly, he has made a way for us to life never ending and he's welcomed us. Because of this, we're caught up in the eternal life of God. A never ending life of relationship and love with God and his people and his creation. 
even though we die and we all taste death, because of God's faithfulness and love, we will rise again. The accounts of Jesus' death and resurrection illustrate this for us, and he is the first among many. We look to him, we follow him, and we trust in God. Three incredible mercies for us to hold on to as we present our body, mind and soul to God this new year. So because of these mercies, Paul urges us together to give our living bodies back to God that he created and loves. Our minds and hearts are all part of who we physically are. It's impossible to have a body without a heart and mind, and a mind or heart without a body. Psalm 139 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We are indeed a complete whole. Do you know that? Do you know that full well today? Do you know that God has made you and that you're wonderful and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? Do you know that your body belongs to God? Try to put aside how you feel about what you look like for a moment. God made you. You bear his image. Your body belongs to him and he loves you. You're not a slab of meat that's thrown before the king. That's not the sentiment of this sacrifice Paul calls us to. But you're a person created and loved, received back into the right relationship with God of love through Jesus. If you follow Jesus and you've given your life to him, your body is a temple for the most precious thing of all, God's Holy Spirit. And he chooses to live with you and within you. So Paul urges us to present our walking around, working, sleeping and eating, thinking, feeling bodies and place them on God's altar as living sacrifices. God's direction is always life and life to the full. Some Christians think that sacrificing our lives for each other and for God means that we are therefore made miserable. Some walk around as if half dead, waiting until the day they die to enter into real life. But we serve God who is a God of mercy, love, joy and light. And instead of death, he gives us life. Life eternal, which can, which starts now. We get to live in that eternal life now. Life eternal that we're called into now by presenting ourselves as living sacrifices to him. Dying to ourselves now so that we can receive this eternal life today. Giving ourselves to God is not about thinking that we're slabs of meat when we die, but new creatures alive and kicking now. We're to present ourselves as living sacrifices. So Paul says to us that our spiritual act of worship, this is our spiritual act of worship. What does that word spiritual mean? It's been translated as spiritual to set it aside from worship that is purely ceremonial or religious. You know, that kind of mind numbing, meaningless religion that was so prominent in Paul's day and sadly remains so today. Paul is urging us to worship in a way that actually means something to us at the deepest level. To worship God in a thoughtful and intelligent way knowing who he is and knowing who we are, knowing what he's done for us and responding to that. But the word Paul uses also means reasonable or logical and a rational response to God's mercy. 
because of all that God has done and is doing for us and creation in Jesus Christ, to give our everyday life, our very bodies, our hearts and our minds to him is in fact the only logical and rational way to respond. God is so great, his actions so great in our lives and on the earth that the only way to respond to him is in every way and all the time. His presence and light invades all parts of creation. His redeeming love is total and absolute. And history is being drawn to the point where all that Jesus has accomplished will be realised. Every part of creation will one day recognise, declare and live in the truth of who he is. Revelation 5 says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. It's the age old illustration, isn't it? The transformation of a butterfly. How can a caterpillar transform into something so completely different? How can one thing change so dramatically yet still be itself? Actually, the word Paul uses when he urges us not to be conformed but transformed is metamorphosis, to change completely. Paul urges us not to be conformed to this age. It's translated as a world, but it doesn't carry the negative connotation towards creation as we might suppose. But Paul urges us not to be conformed to this age or to the culture that surrounds us. The message version puts this part of our passage wonderfully. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognise what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. It's not hard to understand that the world of humankind around us is intoxicating. Yes, there are many, many good things about it. Glimpses of what we should and could be. Pregnant promises of what we will one day be because of Jesus. However, along with it comes humanity's fear, greed, false standards, pressures, ill ambition, control and corruption. All the things... All these things seek to conform us into a certain image. And Paul is saying that this is the wrong image. And we see the only right image if we look at Jesus. Our lives, our bodies, our minds and hearts are destined for much, much more than mere sponges that soak up the latest fear, anxiety, trend or cultural fad. As we follow Jesus, we're journeying further into his kingdom, a kingdom which will one day be all and in all. And we are becoming defined by who he is. There's a tension here, though, isn't there? Paul urges us to live in the day to day, to be practical, to live out our faith in Jesus right here, right now, in this place, in this culture in this world, with these people. Yet he calls us to be aware that we must make a choice to follow Jesus. If not, we will, ine we will inevitably be shaped by forces that would ultimately do us harm. As Christians, we live with purpose and destiny because we know where we're heading. We know who holds our lives and we trust in the promises and mercies he has won for us in Jesus Christ. This means that we can live with real and dependable hope, hope no matter what we face in the culture around us. There's also a call to keep on being changed too. We're not changed once and for all in a single moment. 
The change or metamorphosis is gradual and ongoing as we journey through life with Jesus. We are becoming new. We are becoming new creations. So at the start of 2022, what do you say? Is it time for those of us who haven't given our lives over to Jesus before to do it for the first time? Maybe this is the year for you. And is it time for those of us who have been on the road for a while, who are on the journey already to rededicate ourselves, to keep on keeping on? Whatever place we're in today, let's start 2022 with a big yes to Jesus.